Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the SITREP Podcast Channel, your forward operation space for all things military and historical wargaming. I am your host, Ariskany Jim, and today we are starting a short series of war games and discussions commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War of October 1973. For starters, we're going to begin with the Golan Heights using the Seven Days to the River Rhine system by Great Escape Games. So I did a whole episode on the Yom Kippur War back when the Op Center series was first getting started here on the SITREP Podcast. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Check it out if you're interested. I do apologize in advance for the sound quality in that video. Again, Op Center series was just getting started in those days. Suffice it to say that the Yom Kippur War was the fourth and largest of the so-called Arab-Israeli Wars. First came Israel's War of Independence in 1948 and 49, then the Sinai War in 56, the famous Six-Day War of 1967, and finally Yom Kippur in 1973. Now I'm not going to wade too deep into the politics here. Your take on this is going to rest squarely on how unqualifyingly pro-Israel you are. I'll just say that after their seismic victories against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in 1967, certain decisions and attitudes taken in Israel made another war, a much larger war, absolutely inevitable. This is so clear that the so-called Six-Day War doesn't effectively end. It bleeds into another war, the so-called War of Attrition, that smolders on for a further three years. Even when Egypt's President Nasser finally dies in 1970 and his place is taken by Anwar Sadat, a man who actively wants peace with Israel, he's powerless to pursue that peace until he restores the Sinai back to Egypt, occupied by Israel in spite of UN mandate since 1967. The Syrians, meanwhile, naturally feel the same way about the Golan Heights. Now, I admit, I am massively oversimplifying all these problems, but skipping about three hours of regional geopolitics, let's just say that by 1973, Egypt and Syria really have no choice. They begin forming a united, cohesive plan to retake these national territories from Israel in a general offensive starting on October 6, 1973. This was a date not lightly chosen. October 6, 1973 was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, among the holiest days on the Jewish calendar. Troops would be on leave, government offices would be closed, and mobilization points would be largely stood down. So I only breeze through all of that context and background to illustrate how different Yom Kippur was going to be from all the other Arab-Israeli wars. For once, Israel was not choosing where and when the war would start. For once, it was going to be the Israelis getting hit by surprise. For once, Egypt and Syria had a solid plan, and they would be attacking together at the exact same time, 1400 hours local on 6 October. Egypt and Syria knew all too well just how powerful the Israeli Air Force was, and rather than trying to challenge Israel in the air, they instead built these impenetrable SAM defenses over the imminent battlefields. So no, you won't be seeing any Israeli airstrikes in this game. Serious part of this war is what we're going to be looking at today. This is going to be the Golden Heights, where Israel had just two brigades, the 7th in the north and the 188th in the south, standing against the better part of five Syrian divisions, along with various brigade and regimental support groups, about 100,000 men altogether. In the south, the 188th Brigade had a terrible time. They took massive losses, and the Syrians made some strong gains toward the Jordan River, soon threatening Galilee. Along the northern half of the Golan Front, the fate of northern Israel now rested with the 7th Brigade. Now, of course, the entire brigade would perform magnificently, but one battalion in particular would sail right over the edge of courage and into the realm of absolute legend. This was the 77th Tank Battalion, radio call sign Oz 77, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Avidgor Kahalani. Occupying positions near Kunitra or Al Kunatira, positions like Booster Ridge or Tel Hermanet, the 77th Tank Battalion would defend the so-called Purple Line in a battle that quite honestly defies description. For three days, Kahalani's units fought off the lead elements of what would eventually total three Syrian divisions, sometimes outnumbered in places up to 15 to 1. Now again, we're using the Seven Days to the River Rhine system to recreate a very small part of this battle, known to history as the Valley of Tears. So let's go to the footage and see if Kahalani's boys can stay in tall one more time. So here is our table for today. It measures 6 feet by 8 feet and we're playing in 15 millimeter. We're looking generally out of the west into the east, so we're more or less directly above the Israeli positions on places like Booster Ridge or Tel Hermanet, 
overlooking the imminent Valley of Tears and the Purple Line. This was the demarcation line between the Israelis and the Syrians in the wake of the 1967 war. So we see here some of the Israeli shot battle tanks. Shot was basically the Israeli upgrade of the British made Centurion and we see them in their specially made firing ramps. These were uh, pre-constructed firing positions for Israeli tanks that were built here on this high ground. The idea being to present the absolute minimum target profile to return Syrian fire. They're going to make a big difference with some heavy modifiers here in today's game. Here we see some of the Syrian armor about to mount the assault. Of course we have plenty of T-55s of which there were hundreds in the Valley of Tears along with some of the newer T-62 battle tanks just entering Syrian army service in select brigades for the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Now sharp-eyed viewers are going to be able to quickly point out that all these tanks are technically in Iraqi army markings. That's just because I do most of my modern 15mm armor gaming in the 1991 Gulf War. But unless you're within like one foot, it can easily pass as a, a Syrian armored vehicle. And of course we have more Israeli shot battle tanks of Oz 77 standing ready in defense. Here's a quick low angle shot to illustrate just what these Syrian tank gunners will actually be trying to hit and how little of these targets will actually be visible. Now in 7 days to the River Rhine, hold down normally gives you a plus 1 to your defense. These positions will give you a plus 2. Okay, this game is now underway and we are taking our first shots downrange. I should mention that Mark and Devin are playing the Syrians and Tom is playing the Israelis. So Mark's going to fire that first T-62 there, hold down behind that ridge, and he is targeting that Israeli Centurion sitting there on his firing step. The Centurion crew sees that big 115mm smoothbore swinging towards him and says, oh hell no, we're going to shoot first. Tom has to roll a 3-up on a D6 to successfully react, so boom, he made the roll. Now that Centurion gets to shoot first. Normally in 7 days to the River Rhine, Centurions have to hit on a 5-up on a D10. We're making these guys all for it because A-77 was naturally an elite battalion. So, it's going to be a plus one because Mark's T-62 there is hull down. So now it's an adjusted 5-up. Tom goes ahead, picks up a D-10 and makes his roll. And unfortunately, that's going to be a miss. Mark now takes his shot back and scores a hit with a 9. So now Mark just has to get through the Centurion's armor. The 115mm smoothbore on the T-62 has a firepower of 9. So what Mark has to do is roll a D10, add 9 to the result, and beat the Centurion's armor of 14. So 3 plus 9 equals 12. That's not enough to get through the Centurion's armor. However, we do put a morale token on the Centurion because there is a little bit of damage done. The Centurion got his bell rung a little bit. So the exchange of fire continues. You see all these red poker checks under the Syrian tanks that indicates an activation. Meanwhile, we're using blue checks for the Israelis. And the Syrians are continuing to fire and Tom keeps trying to react and shoot first. And here he rolls a six. So not only does he get to react to the latest Syrian fire, he steals initiative from the Syrian player. So this Centurion is now going to take a shot on this T-55. He does score a hit. Now he just has to get through the Syrian's armor. The L7105 has a firepower of 9, but Tom only rolls a 3, and that T-55 will survive. Later in the turn, the Syrians have initiative again, and Devin is going to try and take a shot with an AT-3 Sagger anti-tank guided weapon team in that building. So they open up their back windows to make sure they didn't roast themselves in their own back blast. Took a shot on the Centurions and missed. The Syrians are having a hell of a time hitting the Centurions in these prepared firing positions. Meanwhile, the Israelis shot back on a reaction shot and have smoked a T-55. You see it burning right there. So both sides have been exchanging fire and exchanging initiative. There's two ways that initiative can switch between the two sides in the game. You can either steal it with a natural 6 on a reaction roll, or the initiative player can voluntarily pass it over to the other side. With some hot dice, the Syrians finally land a hit and manage to destroy one of the Centurions. So I'll take the Centurion off the table, replace it with a wreck tank, and the reason for that is in this scenario I have included a reinforcement mechanic where some of these Centurions can come back on the table later in the game. Syrian dice continue to absolutely be on fire. They have to roll an 8 up on a D10 to hit anything. 
because they have inferior tank gunners and again they're shooting against these fortified hull down positions but they're doing it they're rolling eights nines and tens one after another after another three of the israeli centurions are now on fire that's 60 percent of their tank force and we're not even like halfway through turn one and now they've scored another hit but at least this time the israeli armor holds Okay, we did make a little bit of a rules mistake here We're concerning what was a flying shot and what wasn't, so we sort of retroactively put this Centurion back on the table, and what Tom's doing is he took a shot and then fell back a little bit so that he would not take immediate return fire from all those T-55s. He did land a hit on the Syrian T-55 over here, but again, failed to penetrate the armor. Tom just cannot buy a break on these dice. Don't look now, but the Israelis might be mounting a little bit of a comeback. You see that little jeep there with the Tobe launcher on it? He has just launched a fiber optically guided missile clear across the table and slammed into the flank armor of that T-55 right there. Once he scores a hit, it hits really easily. It's an easy kill because he rolls an 8 on his penetration, plus 12 for firepower against flank armor no less. Yeah, that T-55 is smoked. All right, now we get into some Syrian artillery. So quick note, I don't usually use the tactical advantage cards that come with Seven Days to the River Rhine in historical scenarios. Those tactical advantage cards are kind of random, and here in a historical game of a specific battle, we know who had artillery and who didn't. So I sort of handle it with scenario rules uh, like we see here. So all the rules are explained on that card. The Syrians are trying to drop some artillery into that berm position that holds those jeeps with the tow launchers on them. Yeah, they don't like them. So they score a three on their uh, targeting on the artillery, which does miss. It missed by four, which means it's going to miss by 12 inches in a random D12 direction. So yeah, that's going to be the seven o'clock uh, direction there. That's going to be the actual impact point for this barrage of Syrian artillery. By the way, we're talking about D30s, 122 millimeter howitzers. So now that we have an actual strike point, it's everything within six inches of that strike point. Everything in there takes an automatic morale token for being under artillery fire. And then we have to roll a five up to hit individual targets in that six inch radius. And if we do, then we have to roll about armor penetration. Okay, so, oh, wow. All right, that is going to be definitely some armor penetration on the roof armor of the Centurion. The way we do roof armor is flank armor minus two. So the artillery only penetrates with a two, but when you add 10 because of the awesome Syrian dice, it gives you a 12 versus the roof armor of a Centurion, which is only 10. Long story short, take your first shot. That Centurion is out of gas. Thus concludes an absolutely brutal turn one, at least for the Israelis. Syrian dice have been out of control. So at the end of your turn, you remove all of your colored poker checks. This basically resets your activations. Those white poker checks remain as damage to your units. Now there are ways to get rid of those. You can either do a battle group reorganization check or there are certain fallback orders you can do and we'll cover them as they come up in the game. But what Tom is doing now is he is rolling for his reinforcements. This is a scenario rule that we're using. So how it works is each Centurion that Tom has lost in the previous turn, yes, we're using old M48 junk miniatures as sort of wreck markers. For each tank that Tom loses, he rolls a D10 and on a six up, it gets replaced with a new Centurion on one of those two roads there. This sort of signifies the constant reinforcements that Avidgor Kahalani describes in his account. Also, Kahalani is the overall battalion commander of what is really only a platoon, maybe company-sized battle here on our table. So maybe it's just a battalion commander reorganizing his assets and bringing in new units into this particular sector. This little Jeep tow carrier, man, he is punching way over his weight class. He hits on a 3+, plus, penetrates on plus 12. So, yeah, there are four Syrian tanks burning over here. One, two, three, and we gotta put a smoke marker on that guy. Here come one of our reinforcing Centurions. Notice he is behind a regular ridge, so he only gets the normal plus one defense as opposed to the plus two defense that you get when you're in one of these fortified prepared firing lamps here. 
So, again, the new Centurion came on the table. He drew some fire from a T-62 way over here on a successful reaction test. And Mark scored the hit and then exactly tied the Centurion's armor. So what that means is that the Centurion is now immobilized. Tom now completes his interrupted action. He starts off with a 4 plus to hit because elite Israelis. Make that a 5 plus because he moved, 6 plus because the T-62 has partial armor. He rolled a 10, so he definitely hit that T-62. Now he just has to get through the armor. The L-705 millimeter rifle has a firepower of 9. He rolls a D-10 plus 9. He has to beat an adjusted 14. 9 plus 9 makes 18. Long story short, take your second shot. Man, that T-62 is out of here. There's going to be pieces of him landing for at least a week. Okay, one of these reinforcement centurions might be Kahalani himself, because like we read in the account, he sort of had to kick his guys in the ass a little bit to get them motivated. Something's going on, because Israeli dice are suddenly beginning to warm up. We saw where Tom smoked one T-62, now he smoked a second one, plus this T-55 over here. So that's three kills, plus those original four over there on Devon's side of the table. When you account for Israeli reinforcements, they're only down two tanks. Meanwhile, the Syrians are now down seven tanks. This game might start to align back to the history a little bit. Or maybe not, because here comes some Syrian AT-3 Sagar anti-tank guided missile teams. First of all, I apologize for the Soviet World War II truck. But in any event, the truck drives up and unloads the missile team. You see a second red check there. That's because he had to take a second action. Anti-tank guided missile teams are not allowed to shoot and fire in the same activation. But when the Sagar does fire, he misses that lucky Centurion there. Uh, for once, the Syrians didn't get a good night roll. Then that T-55 immediately follows up with a shot as well. This time the Syrians do hit. But once again, there are guardian angels on the shoulder of that Centurion crew, and that Centurion armor pays off. Uh, you see the white poker check there. He did take a hit, but hey, he survived so far. Now the Syrians bring in some artillery, and because of the hull down fortified position, they will narrowly miss their intended aim point. So how we do it is you miss your aim point by three inches for every digit that you miss the die roll by. So in this case, say he needed a seven, he rolled a six, so he only missed by three inches. And we roll a d12 to see in what direction he missed. And it looks like he was aiming for right between those two teams. He missed by three inches and it's gonna wind up landing right there at the back of that fortified position. So, yeah, that's going to cause a lot of damage because, again, it affects everything within six inches of the final aiming point. So here are the final results of that Syrian artillery barrage. Finished off that mobilized reinforcement centurion, smoked an empty half-track you see there, and also did some damage to two of the Israeli infantry teams there in that firing ramp. So, yeah, that wasn't great. But Kahalani does describe Syrian artillery as pretty effective in the historical battle at the Valley of Tears. So the Israelis are doing better, but they're definitely still on the back foot, mostly because of all that damage they took on turn one. And to illustrate the point, here come three BTR-60s, all fully loaded with Syrian infantry, now heading up the slope on Booster Ridge, and yeah, they're about to take that first objective. That's okay though, uh, there are five objective points on the table, and the Syrians have to take three of them to win the game. Thus, we find ourselves at the end of turn two, which has stabilized the game a little, but again, the Israelis are still facing a bit of an uphill battle. Look at this little centurion here. This guy not only was missed by two saggers, a third sagger hit him, the armor held, a T-55 hit him with a 100 millimeter rifle, survived that as well. Yeah, that guy is definitely uh, standing tall. Meanwhile, we are coming up on a bit of an infantry battle here. Tom is beginning to shift his infantry reserves. That's going to be 75th Mechanized Battalion, by the way. And once those three PTRs crest that ridge and unload their infantry, yeah, we're going to have a hell of a shootout there at that objective point. Further south, there are more Israeli objective points, more or less open for grabs, because the Centurions in those firing ramps have been destroyed. But at the moment, Mark doesn't really have any armor close enough to seize them, at least not yet. 
beginning the turn sequence over for turn three. The Israelis have initiative. That Centurion has fired, but whoop, nope, the uh, T-62 has tried to react. Successfully reacted, but then missed. Tom then hit the T-62 in turn, but when he goes to roll for his penetration, he only scores a one. So, yeah, even an L7 won't get through T-62 armor with dice that bad. So we did roll for one new Israeli reinforcement tank to replace the one that Tom lost on turn two. So the way this works is each Israeli tank that is lost basically gets to roll for reinforcement or replacement, I should say, once. So those two that were destroyed earlier on turn one, they don't get to keep re-rolling. Israeli reinforcements will not be infinite. However, if an Israeli reinforcement tank is knocked out, that tank gets to re-roll once as well. So you can have replacement tanks get knocked out and replaced, and then those replacement tanks get knocked out and replaced. Long story short, take your third shot. At the end of the day, the Israelis are limited to 10 total tanks. So basically, each Centurion can mathematically be destroyed twice, but that's the limit. And they might need it because, yeah, a lot of these Israeli objective points are deceptively weakly held. There isn't a whole lot left to defend them. Bit of a weird case here with that Israeli infantry right next to that burning Centurion. When a tank is lost in the Seven Days to the River Rhine system, you roll to see if the tank is just knocked out or if it actually explodes. And if it does explode and there is friendly dismounted infantry within four inches of the explosion, that infantry takes an automatic morale token. Maybe they took damage in the explosion or they're in shock from, you know, the horrific spectacle of a friendly tank exploding right next to them. Either way, you'll notice that that Israeli infantry is not carrying a morale token. Earlier off camera, Tom took a fallback order, and that's where you can remove some morale tokens, and we forgot to account for that. So basically, we had to retroactively fix it. I just wanted to highlight it real quick, because how infantry take damage from exploding friendly tanks is actually a pretty cool mechanic, and one of the unique features in the Seven Days to the River Rhine system. Looks like Devin is at it again with his Syrian AT-3 Sager anti-tank guided missile teams, and he has now just scored another hit. Who is he shooting at? Oh, come on, man. Who else? This poor Centurion that's been behind the ridge. So far, he has taken a Sager shot, a T-55 shot. Now he's taken another Sager shot. These are all hits, by the way. Another Sager did miss, but so far he's surviving. He takes another Sager in the face and, once again, fails to penetrate. Good grief. So that's now been a T-55 hit and three Sager hits. And again, he's still uh, he's still standing. A third Sager team is going to open fire on him because he really doesn't like that guy. Uh, but this time he actually missed. So now that Centurion has taken a total of four hits, and he's also taken an activation. So he has five total poker checks on him. In order to activate against an MBT, he'd have to roll an eight plus on a D6. So that's not going to happen. Just to activate at all, even on Tom's own turn, he'd have to uh, beat a 5-up on a D6. So this is kind of how you can pin down tanks in 7 Days to the River Rhine. Even if you don't get through the armor, you just keep wearing them out with these uh, with these successive hits. Oh, but now that T-55 hits them, and finally it gets through the armor. Okay, 8 plus 8 on the T-55 equals 16. That will beat the 14 on the Centurion's frontal armor. Good God, man, that was what? Um, if memory serves, three Saggers and two 100mm rifles, and finally he goes down. Man, what a champ. Here comes the long-awaited infantry battle. Now that Syrian rifle squads have finally unloaded from those BTR-60s, and they have crested that first Israeli firing ramp. So this is going to get a little complicated because Tom has been shifting around his infantry trying to head off this threat, which he clearly saw coming. So good news uh, for the Israelis on that. However, they are a little outnumbered. What's going to happen here is the Israelis are going to try to react. Okay, Tom does fail that reaction roll. So those two Syrian rifle squads will shoot before the Israeli rifle squad. However, the Israelis have dismounted from that half-track, so that half-track now technically counts as a separate unit. So now the half-track is going to go ahead and try to react. 
against uh, the other Syrian rifle squad. And this one succeeds. Okay, so it's going to be a little confusing. The half-track fires, then the two Syrian infantry teams fire, then finally the Israeli infantry team is going to fire back at the Syrians. Oh boy. Okay guys, that's where we're going to leave it for today. Suffice it to say that the dice have completely kicked this battle way off of its historical track and into a whole new direction. There's nothing wrong with the way Tom has deployed his tanks or how he's committing his reinforcements. The Syrians are just rolling like fire. Tom, meanwhile, simply can't catch a break. All that said, Tom's Israelis still hold all five objective points, he is getting reinforcements, and he's doing some great work with some of his lighter support units, perhaps picking up a little bit of the slack for those uh, Centurion shots that honestly aren't doing very well right now. The conclusion of this game is going to be right here on this channel next week, so please watch this space and see how this all shakes out in the end. But that's all we've got for you today, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. Please remember to hit that notification bell. Also, please consider joining the SITREP Podcast Discord. There is an auto-accept invitation link to our Discord in the description of this video. Join our community, see what everybody's up to, and best of all, show us what's happening on your hobby table. For now, this is a risky the Gym with the SITREP Podcast. We are rounds complete for another episode, and as always... Thank you, Mike, for watching.